All right, everybody, everybody. Oh my God. Let me tell you something. I told you I have gone global. The guest on my channel is in the UK, United Kingdom, uh, London, and Britain, and all them royal stuff that goes on. That's where he is. But my man is actually out of Jamaica. Oh my God, Yaman and, and all that. <laughs> I'm so excited that he is on my channel. He is good. Let me tell you something. This man know what he's talking about because he lived it, first of all. And then he do the research, went to school for it, I'm sure, and all that stuff. Oh, man, I'm telling you, I tell you, this is going to be good. And I'm, you, can you feel how, how strong Inspirations is coming along? Can you feel that I had a lady, and I, I not had, I got a lady on the channel from Australia, from uh, Nova Scotia, from Ireland. I'm uh, going to be putting up a video in the next short little bit of time with a guy out of South Africa who said he is a colored. <laughs> <laughs> and he lived through apartheid. And then all throughout America, I'm interviewing these people. Coming to you with what I like to call it good black history. And I give it to you straight no chaser, my friends. You know, I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm the guy who come up with it. You see me often. I'm, I'm loading and, and posting five, six videos a week. Last week, I did every day. I got that much going on. People love it. They, they hit me up, said I'm finding people so on and so forth like I did with this gentleman. I want you to come to my festival. I'm having a festival May 27th through the 29th, 2022 in Quindaro, Kansas. More information coming. I'm going to about three, four other cities where I'm going to have you uh, meet me there. Maybe not a festival, but when I get there that Friday night, I'm having a party because I'm still dancing, my friends. They keep <laughs> me in shape, keep me young at heart. And I can think while I'm on the dance floor because I'm always thinking about you. What can I do to help you understand more of this information? Always thinking, what else can I come up with? So next, I'm I'm working on the logo. I'm coming out with the Strong Inspirations apparel. We're going to start with a sweatshirt. I want you to support me on that. Oh, how about this? You know you're watching these videos for free. If you're so inclined and, you know, got a few extra dollars, uh, donate them to the cause. You know, just cash at me something. You know, I don't have no problem with it. I ain't begging. But it would help because I'm spending a lot of time doing this. And my cash app is dollar sign strong, S-T-R-O-N-G, the number four ever, E-V-E-R. That would be a good thing. You know, maybe you could do that. Send a few, uh, so on and so forth. Um, a lot is happening. I got a bunch of things I'm doing even outside of this. It, last year was the first year I came up with this idea called Black Men in a Suit Day. So it's the first Saturday in October, every year. It's this Saturday. I want black men across the globe to wear a suit. It's a show of solidarity. I don't care what you do, you can wear it for 20 minutes or all day long, but put a suit on because it make you feel different. You know, we're wearing more casual stuff. Put that suit on and let them people see. Tell your son and your to, to wear a suit. Y'all take a picture together and hashtag it. Black men in a suit day 2021. Do that. Last year I had, in my first year, I had 500 pictures. I like to go for at least 2,000 this year. And I want somebody across the globe to, to post a picture of them in a suit. We done gone international already. This thing is going to take off. Watch me. Um, uh, let's see what else I got for you. Uh, I'm shooting a movie. I'm shooting a movie that I wrote the script about called Foot Soldiers. 
a 16 year old young African American kid. No, I ain't making him no thug neither. No, that ain't what I'm doing. But he do fight. He 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 fights two three times in the movie. So he gets put out of the regular school and got to go to a youth home. And at this youth home, they assign him this 55, you know, looking year old soul brother, HBCU graduate as his mentor. And this changes both of their lives. I believe that if we had more mentors out there, these young men would be in a little better shape. Those that are growing up without their father. And that's what I hope my movie does. I'm serious about my game, my friends. Watch for it, Foot Soldiers. I had it as a play. Now I'm making a movie out of it. And I'm gonna have a crowdfunding. You know, you always need more money because this movie game is really expensive. And so you can even donate to that cause. I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it and, 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 and filmmaking, I'm not just new to it. Here's one of them that I've done called Business in the Black. The rise of black business in America, 1800 to 1960, slaves who went to college. People say, how that's possible? Well, they had HBCUs open during slavery. And the year the slavery ended in 1865, three more open. Howard had a law school two, three years after slavery in it. Who are them people going? Now, they might not have had ever been slaves, but some of them was slaves. Oh, it's no question. During slavery time, anyway. It's in my movie and it's streaming on Amazon. And also, read my book, Black Business Book. Over 200 facts, similar to the movie, in written form, and uh, many more facts than what the movie could cover. I got all the way slaves got their freedom, including suing and not just running away. All that's in this, uh, uh, in my book. You get one, I autograph it. I got no problem with that. Uh, every 10th book I sell, I donate one to a school. I love doing it. I love it when they, you know, when they get them. Uh, if you read my book and you don't learn nothing new, I give you money back. I'm that confident in this book. Get you a copy of that. Now, go to my website, businessintheblack.net, businessintheblack.net, where all this is on there. Also, follow me on Twitter. I do a lot of tweeting, and my Twitter is a strong dream. That's what it is, a strong dream. So the letter A, strong dream. Now, you might have noticed that I use the word strong a lot. Man, it's not my last name, as you know, any of that. It's just the word I like a lot. Somebody has suggested you should get you a word, and that'll be your brand. Strong is it for me, everybody. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace, which is my introduction for my guest on the channel today, he's a strong brother. We about to rock and roll. Uh, come on, man. Uh, a cool dude, strong man you are. And introduce yourself and let's get it on. Thank you for being on the channel. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Wow. You're doing some wonderful things over there. Yes, thank you. And what's what's, what's your I'm name? Doing... I'm sorry? What's yes, your name? my name's Linford Sweeney. Okay. Yes. And um, I'm what you might call an African centered historian, a cultural engagement specialist, Jamaican gene genealogist, and I've authored two, uh, two books so far. All right. I love it. I told you everybody he's, he's heavy. Yep. Now, let, let me let's talk about you for a minute, as I always do. Well, where are you from? Where were you born? Well, um, I was born in Jamaica, the birthplace of Marcus Garvey, Bob Marley, and Usain Bolt. And when you say the birthplace, not just Jamaica, in the same township that they were born? Not the same town, no. Definitely not the same town. There are two of them. Uh, one was born in Trelawney and two in the Sentan. Uh, but it's right next door to Clarendon, where I'm from. Oh, um, okay. Now, the island is just so big. Do you know everybody in your town? I don't think so. We have three million people on the island. 
Is else that's that big? Yes. Oh, okay. Now, how about in the town that you were born in? How many people live in your town? I was born in a small place called Sutton's District, which probably everybody knew everybody there at that time in the 1950s. Okay. Probably maybe ooh, about uh, maybe 500 people live there at the time. Oh, really? And uh, it was also the place in 1690 where the first uh, recorded rebellion, slave rebellion took place. The in your town? Place. Yes, the exact place, 1690. Okay, hold on, we're going to get to that because I, I don't, don't forget that one, but... Why did your folks live in that town instead of the bigger city? Were they farmers or something like that? Is yes, yes. My, or what? Yeah, my family were poor, poor people, farmers. Um, some, some were planters. Uh, my father was a farmer and he left Jamaica in 1959 to come to the UK. And I stayed with my mother, who was a domestic, and I lived with my grandmother for five years. Okay, now hold on, let's go back a little bit further. Then. Where did he come from, your father? My father- um, Who was the first uh, to Jamaica, how about that? Yeah, let, let's, let's look at the genealogy of my father. My father was the grandson of a Portuguese and uh, an African. Yeah? Okay. So in other words, his grandfather was a white man. I got you. Well, he was a Portuguese man who had traveled to work in Jamaica. He was also a poor man that came to Jamaica and was adopted by another family. And that's how they came about. And my great, uh, his grandmother was African, but she also had Tahino blood, which were the, in, in the original people of Jamaica. Oh. Okay, how about this, do you mind I ask? Do you think that they had a, a, a consensual relationship or not necessarily? It was it was definitely consensual. It was way, way after slavery, uh, quite a number of years after slavery. They okay. had 11 children. Okay. They had 11 children together, of which eight survived, and they're buried together. They, they died in 1925 and 1926. Oh, okay. So that had to be a pretty... Uh... Uh, uh, going against the grain back in then, they had to probably overcome some of them social stigmas and everything for that to work, right? Yeah, uh, yes and no, because in Jamaica, there were lots of mixes. There were lots of what you might call mixed race chill, uh, people. In some areas, for instance, it was known that, you know, the aim was to actually get um, have children that are fa as fair as possible so that they had more opportunities. So Jamaica was always like that because of enslavement and the whole issue of mulattoes and et cetera. Oh, okay. So now you, you, you're going on something here. How about, so what you're saying is if your parent, one of the, one of the parents was white, they lived in a certain neighborhood, which then maybe had a few advantages. Not in Jamaica, not all of them. So most of them did. But my yeah, great grandfather, yeah, yeah. he lived in the country side, up in the hills, with all the other black and mixed race and other white people who lived in that area at that time. Oh, I see. They were so all, now they were all did, farmers. Did did he go to school? Did he have an education? I don't. I don't believe so. I'd rather look at his um, at um, uh, whether he could write. He could not write. He could not read and write. Remember, he was a poor, he was a poor, poor white from Portugal. Was he an indigenous servant? Do you think of some of his families might have been? That that was his he was story? A, he was a young, he was a teenager when he came to Jamaica. So therefore, he was adopted by a family. And the family that adopted him, some were already coming from the white people. So um, my family are like that, you see. We've got a mix of white Tainos, West Africans, East Africans, you name it. Oh, so now um, you, 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 you alluded to J J Jamaica and, and, and slavery and the slave revolt. What, what's that story? This, the, the, the role relating to, well, first of all, some of my family members, were enslaved Africans 
and later became Maroons, Jamaican Maroons, which were runaway enslaved people. Now, my great, great, great grandfather was put on a slave okay, ship. Hold on, hold on. I don't mean no harm. I, I, I do this. You, say that again. They were Maroons because of what? Right. Um, my uh, Many of my family members were enslaved Africans. They in, in, were in, in, enslaved in where? In Jamaica. In Jamaica. Okay. Yeah. Uh, slavery was abolished in Jamaica in 1834. So okay. some of my ancestors, my great great grandparents were already enslaved, and uh, some of those were enslaved. Okay, okay. But I got my you. great 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 grandfather was actually brought over from Africa, and he 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 got his freedom, and his children were born free later on. Okay, who, who stopped slavery when they did in Jamaica? Who started it? Who stopped it? Who stopped it? Oh gosh, it was it was a variety of different things that stopped it. The main, um, two of the main, there were three, three, let's say there were three things. Number one, there were a lot of rebellions. There were more rebellions on the island of Jamaica than all the other islands in the Caribbean put together. Oh really? Yes. They were very, they did not stand back and allow the Europeans to dominate them, they rebelled. Even if they got killed in the end, they rebelled. Resistance was major. Okay, what, what does resistance look like? I mean, here in America, we were able to, if you could escape, you go up north. There you had no real place to run. So how did you resist? Well, initially the Maroons from the 1600s to the 1700s escaped into the hills because in Jamaica, there's some uh, almost inaccessible places. So many of those escaped into the hills and developed communities called maroon communities. Oh, okay. Yeah, and those maroons then um, eventually um, had what we call the first maroon war, at the end of which they were given land and the freedom and freedom to do whatever they liked. Okay, hold on, let me just go back over. So how about this? What do you imagine escape was like? I'm on this plantation here in Jamaica. I break away and I run towards the mountain. Um, in, in, interestingly enough, my last book was, uh, I wrote a book called, um, um, called um, Dreams of Freedom, which was uh, Jamaican short stories. My first six stories related to enslavement. And one of the stories was about a runaway. And it, it, basically it's running away and trying to find the Maroon community. Now, the problem was that when the Maroons had their war, part of the treaty said they were not allowed to take in any more runaways. So that created a problem for a while, but some of the communities still decided to take in runaways. I'm sure. Yeah, and that then led to the second Maroon War. How long did the first one last? Is there a date or time it lasted, on that? Uh, from approximately 1731 till 1739. So for eight years, they're fighting among them. Uh, yes, they fought the British. Okay, uh, what does that uh, war look like? I'm up in the mountains, are the, are the British coming up there? And they tried. shooting at us, or we're going down there, kind of killing them sporadically. No, no, it What's was, that it was like? more. It was more them coming to try and uh, dislodge those people from the hills. But they were all. Many of them were military people. They they were they had come over from Africa or been brought over from Africa. I got you. Many of them were captured in war, so they had military strategies. And many of them you. used the guerrilla tactics, which was very successful. Is there so it, uh, one uh, person or a couple of people that are real noted for helping yes, do yes. something with the, with the revolts? One of those people was Nani of the Maroons, Queen Nani, as we call her. She's now one of our national hero, heroes in Jamaica. And she existed around the late, uh, early 1700s. And she, as I said, became a national hero. And she was one of those who led 
um, the Maroons to victory in terms of the treaty that then uh, occurred. Another was Kojo, and Kojo was the brother of Nani, and he actually helped to, to bro break, broker that treaty in 1739. Was what, what, I mean, she, so what did she do? She, they had guns. Some of them probably had guns, but uh, as I said, they managed to, they managed to um, get guns from, um, by stealing them basically from the, the, the plantations and other places. And they then used those guns against the British. But the British had armies that tried to, um, displaced them, and uh, they also brought in um, what they call mosquito Indians, which were a people um, who were, um, you know, very familiar with that kind of territory, but they had lived in South America, so they brought them in, and they brought dogs in to be able to dislodge the Maroons, but they still weren't able to do that. Really? Now, how did the Maroons make a living up in the mountains to survive? Well, first of all, after, before the war, they basically used to raid the plantation houses. Oh, I love it. Okay. Yes. Before the war, they used to raid. And during the war, obviously, they raided plantation houses for ammunition, for food, and for whatever else they could get. And many of the enslaved people, some of them ran away and joined them. However, after the war, they were given that treaty meant that they, had the, they, had, they were given a certain amount of land, which was classed as maroon land. And they were also, um, uh, they also had the right to come into the towns and trade with Europeans and other peoples. Oh, really? Oh. That was after the war. What, was there uh, something that they had to have as a designation that they were a part of the Maroons and that kind of thing? I, I am not certain how they did that, but they dressed differently. They obviously dressed differently, oh, really? uh, but I'm not, I'm not exactly certain how um, I, they um, distinguished themselves yeah, right, sure. from other non-Maroons. Uh, Probably huh. they, came, they came in a group rather than a, on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, yeah. Okay, how, how about this? Did they, um, uh, is, is there monuments of some sort in the mountains for the, uh, or some designation of the Maroon communities? Well, yes, there, there are still Maroon communities in Jamaica. And right now they're fighting with the government because the government wants to take away um, the Maroon lands that were given to them in the 1700s. And um, so, and also there are memorials to the Maroons. In Chapelton, where I'm from, not far from Sutton's, where I was born, there is actually a monument to Kojo. Oh. So yes, they are, and Nani, as I said, is a national hero. So in reality, the Maroons have had a very important impact on the history of Jamaica. Oh, not, not but where you, where you lived, you weren't, that was not Maroon. No, community. no, no, it wasn't. But you were about how far from the community then, maybe? Um, the nearest community to where I was was where my grandfather came from. He literally lived uh, literally only a few miles away from one of the communities, which was called Akompong. Okay. Yeah. Akompong is a, is a name that comes originally from the Akan peoples of, of Ghana. Okay. Yeah, now the Ashanti. Now, when you were growing up and you were living there, did you go to the Maroon community for whatever no, you, I, you know, wanted to do? No, I didn't because I lived probably, uh, I'd say probably around 30 or 40 miles away from the nearest Maroon community. And I, I, was, I was only young at the time. I yeah, was eight yeah, years sure. old when I came to Britain. Yes. Well, did the so Maroon I, community end up developing uh, business districts, uh, you know, like stores, supermarkets and whatnot? No, no. They, they mainly lived in villages and they kept themselves to themselves and they kept a lot of the old traditions, including the language, the, the religion, um, the spirituality, all of that. Oh. They, all of that. So the Maroons are the ones who are the keepers of ancient African history. It. 
okay, well, how about this? I when I as I've as I've come to Jamaica, I've never had anybody say we need to go to the maroon as a tourist attraction. Is that yes, something there, that happens? Yeah, there is so there is some tourist attraction in the in maroon uh, villages, but they are very particular. They don't want a lot of people coming into their villages. There may be one or two or several, and they also have festivals. So people would come during the time of the maroon festivals. No, oh. is, is it? Do they still identify with the same flag that, that the rest of Jamaica does, or do they have some other? They, no, they class themselves as being separate from Jamaica because, in reality, when Jamaica became independent in 1962, they were already independent from 1739. Oh, so they really they were independent made a mark for themselves. They weren't classed as enslaved people. They were free people. Uh, do you have any idea of maybe how big their community is in terms of numbers of population or something like that? No, no, not a lot, not large, even, even in the 1700s, even in the 1790s when they had the second Maroon War, um, only 500, approximately 500 were in the community that were taken away and they were sent away back to Africa as a result of losing the, that second Maroon War, but the first Maroon War. So I'd say probably maybe in the three, 4,000 Maroons would have existed around in the 17, 1800s. I see. Now, when you say, uh, um, how many white people, if, for lack of a better word, might have actually invaded Jamaica and lived there during slavery times? Well, Jamaica, um, first of all, Jamaica was originally um, taken by the Spanish. Okay. Yeah. It was the Spanish that actually came into Jamaica in the 15, um, well, first of all, you've heard of this guy called Columbus. Right. He landed in Jamaica, his ship landed in Jamaica in 1494. Okay. So they then claimed Jamaica as their own from 1494. But there were but already they, people there, weren't there? Yes, definitely. They were, the Tainos were there. There were lots of Tainos in Jamaica at the time. But within the space, very, a very short space, they were taken, enslaved. Um, basically, they were forced to work for the, the, the Spanish. And eventually they died of various diseases that were brought by the Europeans. Okay. And some of them committed suicide because they didn't want to, you know, uh, operate that way. These were people who lived on uh, on the on the seashores. You know, they were fishermen. They 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 plant cassava. They planted yams and things like that. They okay. You know, they weren't really um, into all the hard work of working on a cane field for 14, 16 hours a day. So Columbus shows up. How, is there an ideal, and maybe I'm getting to understand this, how many ships might have, slave ships might have come to Jamaica? Is that a question? Whoa. Is Well, um, all I can say is that within, within the first, um, within the first, up to, up to 1740, up to the 1740s or 50s, there were approximately something of around eight, uh, 200 ships. No, eight, uh, approximately 800,000 people were transported to the Caribbean. Not just Af uh, not just African, African people? people of African descent as enslaved people. Okay. Uh, around 800, and there were about 200 ships that were plying their trade between Africa and the Caribbean and Britain. It was, it was what was called a triangular trade. Right. Okay. So basically they took goods from Britain. Say, let's take the British as an example. They brought goods from Britain, took it to Africa, sold it in Africa, and in exchange for enslaved people. They then took the enslaved people to the Caribbean and then exchanged them for sugar, and for tobacco and whatever else was grown on the island at the time. Oh. And then they came back to Britain with the sugar, which then is then refined. And then they get monies from that, buy more goods, take it back to Africa, 
and it just continued like that, the triangular trade. Oh. And, the, and the trade from Africa to the Caribbean was known as the Middle Passage. Mm, okay, okay, yes. okay. So now, uh, again, so if you got uh, a, a ship full of, uh, of uh, enslaved people in the hull and whatnot, and the ship might only have another 10 or 15 people, white people on it, Yes. How did the white people? Could, how many white people probably took over Jamaica in the early years? You, you, you got. I mean, the percentage of it's, black and um, white has. Well, to be first, first of all, you've got to realize that the Caribbean was where most of Europe, Europe's wars were were fought. The French, the Spanish, the Dutch, and the British fought nearly all of their wars in Europe. Very few wars were fought in Europe. They were fought in the Caribbean because that's where the wealth was. I was just talking yesterday about okay. the Haitian Revolution. Saint-Domingue, which is now Haiti, that was the richest, that was the wealthiest place, um, the um, uh, wealthiest Spanish, um, uh, French um, colony in the whole world at the, uh, in the 1600s. Uh, sorry, in the in the 1700s, late 1700s, say 1789, when the French Revolution happened, Saint Domingue was the wealthiest place in the whole of the colonies of France, and uh, France had around 20 million people living there at the time, and of that 20 million, almost a quarter were either directly involved or indirectly involved in the slave in the in the, in the slave trade. Why was it so, so wealthy? How about that? Okay, why, why you say those were so wealthy? Because, because of the minerals of, that they had? No, because of the growing of sugar, particularly in the Caribbean, and the growing uh, indigo, cotton. Uh, sorry, yes, some cotton was grown, not a lot. Um, they also, um, there were also a variety of other things that they grew, and they shipped it back to Europe. And at that time, sugar became king. Sugar was really the big thing at the time. Nah, then they you. started to uh, transport rum, etc. All of that made Britain and Europe. The, the, it was the Caribbean in particular okay. that made Britain. Okay, how about this one? This might be a crazy question. I don't know. But did any Black people profit during those times? They, I mean, were they the farmers that they bought it from, or they just come and take their land and put a white man in charge? No. Uh, all right. Here's the thing. Okay. Before, before the, the uh, Africans came to the Caribbean, the white people were already there. Oh. Remember, they came from 1492 all right, into the Caribbean. All right, all the right. Spanish came first, then the French, uh, sorry, the Portuguese um, went into Brazil. The Spanish came, um, the French came, the Dutch came, the British came, and some Scandinavians came. And they all came and they took what they felt was uh, were, you know what they felt was theirs right they made it theirs right because the the indigenous people could not fight back because they were peaceful people they could right. not fight some eventually fought back yes but the point is initially they did not fight back and many of them died so then they brought in white people from europe to work the sugar plantation to work the plantations okay and they couldn't do it. Also, they were what they call the indentured servants. So within five to seven years, they could buy their freedom and they're gone. So they then started bringing in Africans into the Caribbean. So in Jamaica, for instance, the British, uh, the Spanish had already brought Africans in, but only a small amount. And those were the ones who escaped into the mountains and became the first Maroons. Then the, oh, then the British then brought in their own from Africa. And because by then, cane sugar had become important because cane was original, originally grown in the Far East. Then it came to Madeira in Europe. 
or Madeira just off the course of Europe. Okay. And then it went to Brazil. And then the, the Dutch brought it in to the Caribbean. And then people who were already growing indigo and other products decided to switch to sugar because sugar was more, uh, was more profitable. So they then brought in enslaved people. They then, at the time they saw them as three-fifths human. They were classed as property. So they, they were treated more like animals, like horses, like cattle, uh, because that was called chattel slavery. Yeah. And this then became the, 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 the system, the plantation system. They were not paid. They were seen as three-fifths human and they were seen as property. So, so each had a price on their head. Was there uh, the brutality like in America, the lynchings and the hangings oh, yeah. and well, all that I kind would, of thing? I wouldn't say it. I, can't, I, I, I mean, lynching came a, a lot later, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. Uh, but in Jamaica, they had the brutality in the Caribbean was tremendous. Um, put it this way, here's an example. This is brutal. The first Africans who came to the Caribbean, not just Jamaica, but to the Caribbean um, to work, uh, that they were brought to the Caribbean as enslaved people. The first Africans that were brought, they probably lasted a year to three years. Mm. They were worked to death. They were worked for four, 16 to 18 hours a day. And within three, one to three years, they died. So they had to bring more in. So that's why they kept on bringing more Africans in because they were dying. And then on top of that, many people were dying of yellow fever or malaria because that had been brought into the Caribbean also. Okay. okay. And half the populations, white and black, died of malaria. Is there a port of where the slave ships docked in Jamaica? Um, yes, there were there were various ports. Um, um, I, I, it's it's interesting you should ask that. It's not something I've thought about, but I know that you had Kingston Harbour, um, which was which was then um, um, another name. It's gone out of my head, but I'll come back to that. Okay. The wickedest city in the world, Port. Um, uh, it's just gone. Okay. Anyway, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, but the, 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 a lot of the slave ships, along with the pirates, it actually came into those areas in near Kingston. And some went into, came into the uh, ports in what is now Montego Bay, which is the other side of the island. Okay. And some came into Saint Anne, which is sort of like the middle of the island, etc. Most of those places are called port. Okay. Like you've got Port Morant, you've got Montego Bay, which okay. there's a port there. Okay. You, you know, so this was this was how um, it was done at that time. They well, the slave ships were docked, and many of them, the British ones in particular, they will take enslaved people to different islands that were owned or or settled by the British, such as oh. Saint Kitts and Nevis or Barbados, etc. Okay. The, uh, what was there? Uh... Well, is there uh, the same type of uh, commerce amongst uh, uh, among the white people where they were auctioning off slaves or when they oh, brought yes. them, they know who wanted them and that was it? How did that go? No, no. Basically, they they didn't really know who wanted them. What happened, uh, what, what I'm guessing happened, and I've seen it in various films like Roots, etc., um, what basically happened is that the slave ships would come in because they didn't know when these ships were coming in, because many of them docked in on the course of Africa, places like Elmina Castle, where they'd already captured many of the enslaved Africans and brought them to Elmina Castle, where they stored them sometimes for months, uh, whilst the slave ships come. Uh, uh, um, um, come to the dock with their products. And sometimes they'd take weeks before they'd fill a slave ship and then take it to the Caribbean. So by the time it got to the Caribbean, 
um, word would get around that an in, a slave ship was coming in. And so the, the, the plantation owners and others, particularly um, the, um, this were the, the Kingston merchants were the ones who would then be the go-between um, for the ships coming in and the plantation owners or the plantation buyers. And they would come and they would have an auction and they would choose who they wanted based upon how much they wanted to pay for them. Is there an auction site where they know that that's where they store the slaves like they have here in America? Um, I believe there must have been. Um, it's yeah. just that I have not I have not been able to okay. access information about that. But obviously, wherever wherever there uh, there's trade, there's going to be somewhere where they keep these people. Yeah, right. So they would have kept them in some kind of a um, what we might call like a warehouse, but yeah, more right. like a prison type warehouse right um and then they sold them off as quickly as possible so that they didn't have to feed them and clothe them and so yeah, yeah. Ooh. uh now um are there plantations in in jamaica that are still standing today yes there are plantations in jamaica uh, many of them are actually in disrepair um Interestingly enough, I've been I my a, a relative of mine used to manage one of the areas near in Montego Bay, where there was a house called uh, called um, which is a great house, which is called a Rose Hall Great House, and Rose Hall was a huge house where the white people lived. The great house is where the white people lived, okay. and so they had dungeons. They had lots of rooms, they had upstairs, they had all sorts. They even had a, a, a tunnel where they can escape to the seaside to get on a ship if things went wrong. And oh, I've been really? there and I've seen it. And they had they have many of those great houses. Some of them are now museum pieces. Um, so, others so when people been, come to Jamaica, uh, they do come looking disrepair. for, you know, visitors, they do look for the Jamaican black history slave trade history stuff yes yes there there is a lot of history in jamaica but the point is the history um they've sort of covered up the history of jamaica the the, the enslavement history yeah it's more like it's been covered up and even now there are people there's someone on youtube for instance who is now finding a lot of these places which have been forgotten because, as I said, there's a shameful history to Jamaica, and the Jamaican government doesn't don't really want to play with that. They're more interested in the normal tourists who come to the beaches, come to the hotels, and go and go back. I got you. Now, okay. So as we move up a little bit on this timeline, then how did Jamaica become a black ran island? If, if, if I'm saying that correct, and, and push the white people out, when did, how did they do that? Well, obviously, um, what happened after, after slavery was abolished in the 18, for, uh, 1834 in, in the British Caribbean, uh, because that was, it's, in, in the rest of the Caribbean, it was different. Cuba, for instance, it was in the 1880s, slavery was abolished. I don't know whether you know that, 1880s, uh, way after America. Um, and in other and so and the French had abolished theirs a bit earlier, but the point is the British abolished slavery in 1834 in the Caribbean islands. So Barbados, um, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, places like that, got their uh, got um, were now free to actually ply their trade. The problem is they did not give them anything, but the slave owners actually received compensation for losing their property, which were the enslaved people. Yeah. Whilst the enslaved people got nothing. So therefore they were poor. There, there were no schools, no hospitals, no roads, nothing apart from in Kingston and in the, the big, the, the larger cities like, uh, like Montego Bay. So there were basically nothing. So they basically were just thrown out and they were told they could work for the plantation again but if your family had worked for plantations in a brutal fashion for so many years, you don't want to work for a plantation oh, sure. again. 
Sure. So they brought in people from all over the world, from the Middle East, uh, from Europe, uh, from India, from China, uh, um, various, and even, even West Africa. They brought in people after slavery was abolished, which was 1838 was the proper emancipation. So it took four years for emancipation. Okay. Um, even though it was abolished in 1834, they had what they called an apprenticeship right. system, right. which was no different to slavery. Right. So it, by 1838, they got rid of it altogether. Part of the reason slavery was gotten rid of was because of the rebellions. And one of the most famous rebellion was the Baptist rebellion in 1831. And that was literally the last straw for a lot of the planters because they burnt the plantations. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm saying is um, they brought in all these people. They brought in Germans. There were, uh, there's a place in Jamaica called Germantown where they brought in 200 Germans and their families. And they brought in Portuguese, they brought in Lebanese, they brought in people from um, Portugal, um, from India. Um, in particular, if you go to Trinidad, you'll find half the population are Indians and half are Afro, Afro, um, of black origin, African origin. And that was because over half a million Indians were brought in after emancipation. Okay, and it's well, say, okay, hold on now. Maybe you answered this. They brought them in. Why? To work. To do the same work the Africans had done. Ah, I see. But many of them didn't want to do that. I see. So therefore, the sugar industry declined. I see. I see. Okay, so now Jama is J Jamaica now presently, the government is black and all that, right? Well, I'm coming, I'm coming on to that. What okay. then happened? There were, there were a lot of issues, a uh, lot of problems because the Jamaican population, the black population were poor. However, they also had another, they had, they had, several, they had several Jamaicas. Uh, they were the, what you might call the white Jamaicans who were prosperous. You had the mixed race Jamaicans who they called in slavery mulattoes, which is not used anymore. But they were the mixed race because many of the black women were actually um, um, let's just say raped by a yeah, lot of sure, sure. white men. Sure. And, and as a result, it produced a whole group of people, another group of people similar to what happened in Haiti, the free coloreds right. in Haiti, right. the free people of color. And they then were sort of like next in line. Right. And at the bottom were the ordinary Jamaicans who didn't have the color and they didn't have any land or any money or anything and so that continued for a while but the the ordinary jamaicans the black people of african descent with the darker skin ended up being so poor that eventually they fought against all of that in the 1930s and then jamaica became unionized and through the unions they then created um political parties and, and wanted freedom, and wanted independence. Okay. And at that time, remember, colonialism was a big thing all over in Africa, in the Caribbean. And even in 1945, I'm from Manchester in Britain. In 1945, okay. they had what they call the Pan-African Congress in Manchester. And as you know, the Pan-African Congress was championed by W.E.B. Du Bois. Right, right. And he was here in Manchester in 1945 when all the African countries and the Caribbean countries, they all met in Manchester and they decided they wanted um, to be rid of colonialism. And as a result of that, people like Nkrumah was here. Kwame Nkrumah came, was in at that conference. So was uh, Jomo Kenyatta. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, Aston's Banda, all of these people were at that conference. And at that conference, they decided they're going to have freedom. And so by 1957, Ghana received its freedom. And after that, in the 1960s, a whole host of countries, including Jamaica in 1962 and Trinidad and Tobago became independent. 
Now, I'm not saying the people that edited those parties were black, they were white. Oh, or really? better still, they were mixed race. They were mixed race people right, that edited those parties, such as Norman Washington Manley, Buster Manti, those people. Yeah. So what I'm saying, they then created the Jamaica that we have now, which is 1962, became independent from Britain, even though the Queen is still head of state. It's not a republic. And so what's now hap then happened in the 1960s, we still had the same structure, the whites at the top, mixed race, the blacks at the bottom. Right. That still is a problem in Jamaica today. Okay, now, uh, but the, is the, but in Jamaica, there is one guy who is the president of the whole island of Jamaica. Is the that prime right? minister? Yes, prime, the prime minister. minister. Yes, but th he's black, right? Yes, he is black. And has they all been black since the independence? Um, the, no, what what the first the first um, the first. Um, Prime Minister of Jamaica was uh, Buster Manti. Uh, was Norman Norman Manley was the, uh, was there as the first um, interim Prime Minister, if you want to call it that, before independence. But after independence, it was taken over by somebody else who was. I said he was the cousin of Norman Washington Manley. They they were what you call mixed race, but very. They looked white, yeah, but they you. were mixed. They had black in them. I got you. Then, then later on, you had people like um, no, um, Ashira, who was darker in color. I got you. Then you had people like uh, Manley, Michael Manley, yeah, and then you had Siaga, who was who was um, Syrian or Lebanese, I believe, or Syrian or Lebanese descent, yeah. Okay. And since then, since then, they've been black. Okay. Yeah. Now, it, it, as we kind of come to a close, we can talk forever, I'm sure. And, and you, 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 you're knocking it out the box here. <laughs> Is there in Jamaica? Can you get a good education in the school system through whatever means, and you go to the Jamaican college? Is that all What's black right? college? Those kind of things. In Jamaica, the education system is very good. Um, and some people have even said that it is better uh, at the school level, um, particularly at high school level, the education is better than even in Britain. Some people have said that. However, the education that um, has come from, it came from Britain originally. Um, but what has happened is the literacy rate is very high in Jamaica. It's around 85%, 80%, um, which is quite good. Yeah. Um, so we do have uh, lots of schools in Jamaica. Um, we also have colleges. We've got the University of the West Indies. And, and so lots of people, I've, I've cousin of mine recently, He's never, he, he's not, he, he's, he's never studied outside of the island. He's now a PhD. Okay. He's the first blind PhD in the whole of the island. Okay. You know? So what I'm saying, people can get their, their education in Jamaica and that education can actually be used outside of Jamaica because yeah. the University of the West Indies is you. known as one of the top universities in the world. I got uh, and this goes to that same point. A person can come from uh, very meager means in Jamaica, and there, uh, other than their desires and what have you, they can uh, ascend to high heights, be a head of a corporation, that be whatever light or dark complexion he or she may be. There's nothing it, holding person back in Jamaica. It is like possible. That. It is possible. But two key things come into it. Number one is money. If you're going to reach those high heights, your family has to have some kind of money or you have to be sponsored in some way through a, a scholarship of some kind. Right. So if you have that, it is possible. The second thing is the color of your skin still matters in Jamaica. So if you're fair, you're more likely to have money anyway. 
I'm not saying all fair-skinned people have money. I got you. But you're more likely to. I got you. And so that has a big impact on, on, on what you do. And obviously, uh, there is a third element, and that is a lot of it is down to who you know. Oh, oh okay. I got you. I got you. I think um, it's, it, it's not dissimilar to America or even in the African countries. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. You I know, got you. Even in Britain, even in Britain. If you want to go far, to some extent, you have to go to, say, Oxford or Cambridge or one of these universities yes. to be able to become, say, prime minister. Yes, it's not yes. that easy otherwise. Yeah, I got you. I got you. I guess just one more question. You left Jamaica um, and moved back, uh, moved to, 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 to London. Uh, do you go back to Jamaica to see family? Uh, yeah, I as as I said before, I was born in Jamaica. Right. Um, but I came here to with my mother to join my father when I was eight years old. Oh, okay. So and okay. and then my parents then moved back to Jamaica. My father built a house and bought land, and he moved back to Jamaica in the 1980s along with my mother. So I went back. I therefore since then. I've been decided to go back. Um, my father was with my mother, so it was okay, but he passed away in 1999. Okay. And left my mother. My mother only passed away three years ago. She was 94 years old. She was my teacher, my history teacher. Okay. You know? And she, I had to go back on a regular basis just to see, make sure that she was okay. Okay, I got you. That is where I'm I'm a close there on this note. Okay. And and I'm a close there with this regard. From what you tell me, and I think I got this right, your father grows up poor, grandfather. Yes. He then has his son who has some knowledge, some wherewithal, does something with his life, let's say. Then he goes to Britain and makes it even bigger. And then he goes back to Jamaica and buy a house, build a house and get some land. And now he, he has progressed that much. Um, it was more to do with the fact that in Jamaica, you couldn't make that kind of money to be able to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to build you. a house or to even get land. It was very difficult. But in Britain, he was able to work for the companies that could pay him a reasonable amount, yeah, that he I could save the money to be able to buy land and build a house in Jamaica. Oh, my God. That's uh, And everybody, y'all catch this. I'm sure it's what he's saying. He went from, uh, let's say, uh, for lack of from nothing to greatness. Yeah, he was a farmer before that. But, I mean, as I said, his, his grandfather yeah, yeah, right. was a white. His grandfather was a white man, but his father was mixed race, but he also had land. My father inherited the, la the land and planted the land, and he sold the land to be able to come to Britain, I or part it. land. I we had it. what was called family land as well I as his you. land. I got you. So I he sold you. cattle and land to be able to pay his fare to come to Britain, to be able to work. Um, he came to Britain in 1959 and left in 1986. I got you. Okay, yep. so I, one more. You said you have some books that you've written. Do you have the books there you can show us? And oh, oh, and, gosh. and, and how yes. people can uh, read your books and what websites you have. How do we stay in touch with you? I think the easiest thing is to go onto my website. Okay, um, which is uh, inspiredhistories.com. Is what now? Inspiredhistories. Dot com. Inspired it's on the back of my, on the back Everybody, of my that's going to be uh, on the uh, in the description. And the name of the books are again. The first, uh, well, one, uh, the, the main book that I'm talking about now, the first book was a motivational book, which was called At Peace With Myself. Yeah, so it was nothing myself. to do with history. Yeah. Because I'm also a coach, you see, a life coach. So it was more about spirituality and um, motivation. So that you. was published in 2011, which is still on Amazon. Yeah, and I it was you. called At Peace With Myself. Yes. The second book was published in 2016, 
and it's called Dreams of Freedom, a collection of Jamaican short stories, which I wrote. Yes, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Hey, everybody, this is what I do is strong inspiration. I find these, oh my God, these, oh man, these unbelievable people who are doing this thing. And I let them tell the story. And he, I, I, I'm very much more clear on, 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 the, on the slave and the inhabitants and all that of Jamaica. Uh, well, thank you so I, very much for being on the yeah, show. Can I also, can I yeah. also include one yeah. other thing? In November, I'm running a four-week course on the history of Jamaica. Oh, okay. yeah. And it will be on Zoom. So uh, it's also on my website. Okay. So if people want to know more, they can go onto my website and look at my events. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna blast that out. We're gonna stay in touch as we get closer and do what we can to promote that. Yep. Uh, and, for, and, and my and, and my current course for this month in in Britain, it's Black History Month in October. You have it in February. We have it in October over right. here. Right. And so I'm running a course, a four week course on Zoom also called Powerful African Queens and Women Warriors. Love it. Which goes from ancient Egypt right up to the US, the women of the US civil rights movement. Ooh, my God. Oh, yes. <laughs> man, you are an expert, man. You an expert, man. I, boy, I'm, I'm so happy <laughs> on my channel. This guy is tight. Oh, my God. Thank you for being on the channel. Thank uh, you everybody for hit the subscribe button, hit the like button on this video, because I know he blew your mind. He blowing mine. I, I'm out of question. That's why I stopped. <laughs> I got nothing left. Uh, uh, follow him. Let's stay in touch. We're going to blast him out. We're going we, 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 I'm, I'm coming to London at some point again soon when this vaccine and virus thing. I, I, I really want to meet you. Uh, and, and we go from there. Uh, everybody, you know what I want you to do. Stay strong. And, and, and this is in particular to you. And I say this with all sincerity. I do want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I love what you're doing, uh, preserving that history, telling people about your native land and the, and the new place where you live and, and, and enlighten them. <laughs> they need some, I'm sure. Yep. And and uh, we're gonna stay in contact, everybody. I, well, I guess with that, I'll say uh, bye bye. We out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.